Ladies, so gentlemen, thank you very much for, uh, for attending our session. We are very lucky to have the professor uh, with us. And the, uh, the credit actually goes to uh, our dear friend Marwan Jehani. Marwan runs the business of uh, consulting, training, or coaching, or among others. Uh, professor Jai for another uh, for another class on another uh, mission. Nevertheless, we managed to steal you for a uh, couple of hours. So yeah. Thank you very much, Shukran Marwan, for making this happen. Uh, this is our first co uh, joint uh, uh, educational uh, uh, activity between EO and between Jamaat Al Faisal. So I'm assuming you're all Al Faisals. Uh, so you don't have to add the introduction. What about us? EO. We're putting some of the uh, the banners uh, I'm happy to say uh, uh, EO for the, the for we have prospect members in the Mumkin EO is a global organization started in the US. Umrah It's a thirty years old today. We're over thirteen thousand members. So it's the only entrepreneurs to entrepreneur organization. And uh, it's appeared to be our objective, basically two things, learn and grow. So we want to help organization and individuals, and we try to touch a 360 uh, degree about uh, individuals and your person, your family, community, bus uh, uh, business. I hope I did not miss anything. So anyway, 360 of uh, uh, what else may, uh, worth mentioning? Um, we do have a lot of things. Uh, if you're interested, let me know. We will talk, walk you through, and we will help you. Uh, help, hopefully, we'll get to that. We're very happy. Yom, uh, and our first female. Uh, hopefully, we'll do an, a co an event that you will meet uh, your uh, your other peers of Hada. We put and another Sayyid that is coming on board. So. We have females members of Yom for Riyadh, so it's been a while. Oh, we're very happy about this. And, uh, also worth mentioning, they come into Sayyidat, the Hukman of Yoran Al Faisal. We just launched our Global Student Award, uh, Entrepreneur Award, in collaboration with Al Faisal University. So this is this is a global award that competes with all of the world, with students. You have to have a business that generates a thousand dollars, whatever. So it's not about being profitable or not. It's, it's basically a student that is launching a business. We launched uh, with a partnership with Al Faisal. It's not limited to Al Faisal. Other students can uh, participate as well. So spread the word. students here. You're PhD, And this is something that we're very happy to say. This is the first award that we do. Uh, as an EOR for Riyadh. I think Jeddah is a lot of innocent. But nevertheless, again, we're very happy to have this. If they will come out they will compete globally. The prize is, uh, uh, there's three levels, and they ask, I think the first prize is $25,000. With that said, I'll go back to our guest of honor. Once again, thank you very much for being in Riyadh and for uh, 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 being with us. Uh, I believe this is the first uh, time Dr. Professor Randall is in Riyadh, and hopefully this is one of many to come. Uh, you came at the right time. The weather is lovely. The weather is lovely. So no complaints about Mother Nature. No, no. Uh, if you came in a few months back, maybe it, is, uh, it could be an issue. Uh, professor is, uh, is the director of Leadership Institute at London Business School. Among Monday, he is an advisor of many the Fortune 100 leading organizations. Uh, the topic of today is something that touches every one of us, whether in business, whether in families, whether other. everyone wants to have a high performance collaborative team, whether in, in business or in, fam in, in house. So uh, uh, say, saying, saying this, I'll leave the floor to the professor and please teach us how can we build high performance collaborative team. Because I'll have to say, I, this is a pain. I have all, yeah, almost about 200 employees, and I cannot, and I struggle. So, uh, looking forward to getting uh, takeaways, and how can we go back to our organization and build okay. that kind of team that we all look forward to have. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Professor. Well, we all struggle. 
with how to effectively collaborate with our, with our peers and our friends and our family. Um, this is a kind of summary of research of things I've been working on over the last 25 years. Um, and in the end, I, I hope that there are some very clear, I think there's some very clear takeaways from it. Um, if at some point you have a question, I'm totally fine. If you raise your hand, you have a question, you don't understand something I've said, or you think it's completely wrong and you want to challenge me, I'm fine with that. Um, and then as we get to the end, I'm, I will open up definitely for just general questions about any of these things, if, if that will also be helpful. The class is coming from the school. This is an open class. They are coming. And just want to tell you, in case we miss each other at the end, we have openings in human resource management and strategy. If any of your colleagues, uh, students, looking for jobs, they can contact us. I'll give you the ad, and if you give me your email, we'll send you the ad. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on all that stuff, so as well. Not hard to find me at all. Um, so we don't have a clicker, so I'm going to have to keep going back here. Um, oh, did it is, it, is it projecting? No. no. Uh, needed to warm up. OK. So there are about five things I wanted to talk about. The first thing is, why does this matter? Why teams and collaboration? Second thing I wanted to talk about is what does it mean to have a high performance team? How would I define that? What does that look like? What does that mean? Then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why does diversity or what does diversity have to do with high performance in teams? There is some relationship, but maybe not what you think. How do I manage the conflict that emerges when I have different points of view around the room? And then finally, what is research, what is evidence-based uh, around how to collaborate more effectively? and try to give you some very clear, uh, concrete takeaways uh, from that work. Um, now, first of all, kind of why teams and collaboration? Um, well, first of all, many organizations are interested in this. Uh, very easy to put together, a, bring together a group of stars, a group of very good individuals, but that is no guarantee that they're going to actually work very effectively together. So in the last three months, Here's the selection of companies that I've had the pleasure to work with, uh, from Carlsberg to LVMH, Honda, Farisha, PwC, and so on. And if you actually go out into the world and say, um, you know, what, where can I learn about teams, collaboration, working together? There's a whole lot of resources out there. Loads of books and articles and things on social media. Um, so here's just a small selection of these. If you go on Amazon for the best seller uh, on Teams, you're going to come up with small groups with purpose is the best seller. Uh, that particular book is very big because it advises you on how, it advises people on how to build a small community-based team in the context of a church. And it's very popular uh, in many religious uh, circles. Probably the best books that are out there right now are, I would highlight, Leading Teams, um, done by Richard Hackman, who's one of the kind of absolute uh, founding uh, fathers and figures within the team literature. Um, and Smart Collaboration, uh, in particular, Smart Collaboration is written by one of my former PhD students who's now at, at Harvard University. And she talks about, uh, was, it's actually from her dissertation talking about why is it we bring together all these brilliant people in consulting and they don't work very well together? What's the problem? How do you resolve it? So, and here's one of the main points she makes. Most firms have carved up their highly specialized professional experts into narrow expertise. And we do that because they want support uh, and we want to learn from each other. Um, and yet their clients and most of the people out there in the world need to solve complicated integrated problems and they don't fit very well together in most of the world of work. So, um, so questions for you. I'm actually going to ask you some questions here. Let me just put this up. So when working with a group of people to deliver an engagement or 
just working together generally, we can use it. Which leader actions are most likely to help uh, the team produce good outcomes over time? I want you to pick two, and I want you to raise your hand uh, when we get to them. And I want to see who votes for which. There are six items here. I want you to vote for two. The first one, ensure all team members feel psychological safety. They feel confident that they can say what they really believe. Two, focus on creating a high degree of cooperation within the team. Three, work to ensure the team operates in a well-coordinated fashion uh, with few misunderstandings. Four, provide clear direction and process to your team. Five, emphasize the shared values within your team. Or six, draw attention to diversity within the team, within the group. So let's do this. Hands up for those who are voting for the first one. Ensure all team members feel psychological safety. So how important is, how many people vote for safety? Some, not a lot, some. Focus on creating a high degree of cooperation amongst your team members. How many vote for that? A few more, okay. Three, work to ensure that the team operates in a well-coordinated fashion. One vote, maybe two, okay. Not getting very many. Uh, four, provide clear direction and process to the team. Okay, a few more. Five, emphasize shared values within the team. Okay, a few more. Six, draw attention to diversity within the team. One, two, one and a half. We're going to call that a half. Okay. Now, I'm going to share with you, um, London Business School, my leadership institute, just released a global survey of 2,000 executives, 2,000 plus executives from all over the world. And we asked them what they thought on that very same question. And maybe not surprisingly, they voted, I think, for pretty much the same kind of things that you did. So one, two, three. The three things that got the most votes were um, provide clear direction to your team, make sure everybody knows exactly what they're doing. Two, ensure, uh, emphasize shared values. And three, focus on creating a high degree of cooperation within your team. Those are the ones that most people, when you're thinking about collaboration and teams, focus on. However, I'm going to try to persuade you of something a little bit different. Here's what I'm going to try to persuade you of. These are the things that are underemphasized in collaboration in teams. First, psychological safety. Psychological safety is one of the best predictors of whether a team does well or really poorly. Two. Work to ensure the team operates in a well-coordinated fashion. So coordination rather than cooperation. It turns out most people want to work well with their colleagues and peers, but they misunderstand each other. They struggle to understand each other. They struggle to actually work together. That's usually the problem, not I don't want to work with you. Okay? Occasionally you get I don't want to work with you, and we'll talk a little bit about some of that, but most of the time not so much. And the last one, Drawing attention to diversity within the group turns out to be very important because it will signal everybody in the team that we may misunderstand each other. And when I say diversity, we'll talk about this. I mean all kinds of diversity. Could be gender, it could be uh, you know, tribal background, but it could also be just somebody who's trained in IT versus somebody who's trained as an accountant. You know, that's a type of diversity that organizations struggle with as much as any other. And if we draw attention to the idea that there's lots of diversity within the team, that will signal people that we need to work well together and that I need to pay careful attention because that person over there is different from me. They may look just like me, but they're different from me because they have a different background to me. Um, so I'm going to try to persuade you of something perhaps different maybe than when you came in. So just to be clear, what is the team? A small, I'm talking about people, you know, under 20 people here in general. But of course, most people think of teams like this. A camel is a horse put together by a committee. Okay? Or you could switch it around. Right? A, a horse is a camel put together by a committee. If you need a camel because you're in the desert and you end up with a horse, okay, that's not very helpful. 
they're going to you know, die of thirst very quickly. Or vice versa, right? You need a horse to run fast. And camels have many blessings and are many, have many positives, uh, but they don't run like a you know, Arabian stallion is going to run. Okay? So if you actually look out there, people will tell you that teams are, they struggle, all the problems that they have. But actually, um, research shows something a little bit different. So Carl Jung, one of the founding fathers of psych modern psychology, said it this way, when when 100 clever heads join together in a group, one big nincompoop is the result. Now, if you don't know the word nincompoop, you probably don't need to, just kind of read what it sounds like, okay? Um, it's not a, uh, not a positive term. Groups actually, though, predict more and better outcomes when they work together than when people are working individually. Okay, let me repeat that. The most widely repeated research finding in the teams area is that teams actually work. Collaboration actually works. Okay, it's no accident that presidents, prime ministers, and kings have an advisory team around them. It's no accident that chief executives have an advisory, a top team around them. It's no act, the whole world is structured this way for a very good reason. So team matters. Team is important, um, and research is very clear. But the trade-off is time. And sometimes people forget that if you're going to use a team, you have to allow enough time to use a team. If you're in a hurry, team is not a good idea. Collaboration, working together, takes time. Now, if you have to get it right, absolutely right, use a team. But it will take more time. Okay. Now, if you're in a rush, though, pick your best individual and let them run and hope for the best. So building a high-performance team is about, I'm going to talk to you about, there are three ways to think about this. One, the right people combined with the right group process equals high-performing team. So right people, do I have the right people in the room, the right mix of people to work effectively together? Two, the great group process. You have to be able to work collaboratively together in order to achieve this. Creates a high performance team. Or take two. Another way of thinking about it is this. High performance teams have three interrelated qualities. Number one, if you want to know, if you want to measure it, you need to have good outcomes. Two, the members need to feel they benefit individually, which is part of why psychological safety is so important. And three, they need to be viable over time. It can't just be get to the finish line and fall apart. For those of you who are students, you work in a student group that lasts for the term. Sometimes you get to that where halfway through and you think, you know what? I'm not going to fight this anymore. I'm just going to power through, get to the end, and I will never want to see these people again. That is not a high performance team. Okay? A high performance team says it's, uh, it's so unfortunate that we have to you know, move on now because I would love to keep working with this team. Okay. Now, here's take three. Oh, uh, another way of thinking about it. And this is actually, I'm writing a book on high performance teams. So this is actually a little preview uh, of the model that's going to come through in my team, uh, team's book. So start with trust. Now, this is a visual. What you do is you then establish goals and uh, content and kind of overall kind of limits. Then you let people explore, share information, explore, understand. You may have limits in terms of time, money, et cetera, but allow people, and this is the scariest part of team leadership, allowing people genuine freedom to explore within constraint. At a certain point, you've had enough, you're looking to narrow down, you're making a decision, and hopefully you implement. So I've been teaching this way for 20 plus years. And only recently, one of my colleagues, as I was drawing this on the board, she was watching me teach, said, Randall, you have created a stingray. So this is now the stingray model of team leadership um, as a visual representation of how team process should look over time. So there's a third way to think about team and team performance. Now, teams don't always get it right. How many of you have been in this team? You dispense or you don't have any boundaries. 
you have a, a five hour meeting and at the end you have no idea what's happening next. Talk, 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 no decision. I've certainly been at that meeting and I imagine many of you have too. Right? So that's one way uh, of understanding team dysfunction where it doesn't go well. Failure to focus. Here's the other way. The next leader comes along and says, forget all the process. I'm not going to let you explore. We are going to make, you know, I want you to do that, you to do that, and you to do that. It's highly efficient. Get teams going. Here's the problem with that. You get to that point of decision and implementation falls completely apart. So this is actually failure to actually deliver because I told you to do that. You didn't agree with me. I told you to do that. You didn't quite understand, but you didn't dare ask. Okay. And you over there completely disagreed. So you're doing your own thing, ignoring me. Okay. Um, there's a lot of that in small group collaboration. We smile, we nod, we say yes, we shake our head and you do your own thing. You know, the challenge is not uh, to, uh, the challenge is really to get people to genuinely, you know, work together. All right, so this, what does this photo tell us about high performance teams? Anybody want to shout out a response? What do you think this says? Yeah. There's a clear direction. So there are all the fish are swimming in the same direction. Good. What else? Sorry? Having a, leader. Uh, having a leader. So the stripy fish trust. is a leader. Trust. They're working together in a school. Yeah? Sorry? Yeah? Sorry, I must be going deaf. Yeah, there's only one stripy fish. Well, not in the ocean, right? <laughs> Lots of stripy fish. But in this particular photo, right? So, yes? Uh, they're all stuck together. Yeah, they're all stuck together. Interesting range of responses here. Um, yeah, go back. Yeah, so for many people, and certainly in the Anglo world, when you look at this, that leader, the leader is the fish on the left, the stripy fish, the big fish, the one that's a little special. Okay, but that's not the only way to think about teams and leadership, especially at the team level. Um, it actually can look really quite different. So to a Japanese manager, or a Chinese manager for that matter, the focus is on the group of goldfish. And whether that stripy fish has anything to do with it, we're not sure. Maybe, just maybe, there's a giant shark just off to the right, chasing them all. And if you're the big fish, you just have to swim a little bit faster, and then you know the, the goldfish are, the, are lunch, and you're not. Okay? In Singapore, they have a very specific word for this called kiasu, which you know you can see it on the highway sometimes, people doing this in order to keep everybody behind them so that nobody can get around, okay? Gives them clear space in front, okay? And sometimes our official leaders may actually be holding the group back, okay? Or finally, if you are in the Nordic region or in other, some other parts of the world as well, you can think about shipping a box of crabs without a cover. Anybody know anything about crabs? Yeah? So you actually ship them without a cover most of the time because crab one crawls up to the side of the box. Crab two goes on crab one. Crab three pulls crab two down. Okay? And they never make it to the top. They don't cooperate. Crabs are incredibly non-cooperative with each other. Okay? So they're, they're, they're so competitive that they can't cooperate and collaborate. Um, so what this might be suggesting is the group of goldfish here are about to go after the stripy fish to say, no, no, no. You think you're special? You are not special. Okay? We will discipline you. The nail that sticks up gets pounded down. Okay? You can't stick out amongst the crowd. Leadership comes from behind and within, not in the front. So this is actually from cultural psychology, looking at teams 
uh, and team uh, and leadership and culture. And what it shows is, I think quite clearly, you can have a very different, you can look at the same thing and see something that's actually quite different. So I'm going to describe for you some research I've been doing over the last uh, uh, four or five years, actually, um, kind of making some of this point. So I'm looking at interviews, 30 plus in-depth interviews in three different regions in the world. Um, so I have a student here this evening who did the 30 interviews in Saudi. Uh, he suffered through all that. Um, interviewing people who are managing teams, who've not worked outside their country and interviewed in, the native, in their native language. Um, and we're interested in what, is it, what are the logistical differences of team leadership? What does that mean in terms of strength? What does that mean in terms of potential you know, issues for concern or weakness within, the, within that structure? So I'm going to start first with the kind of Anglo-American teams. They're highly individualistic. It's about individual members within the team. Um, they're low power distance, meaning the status between the leader and everybody else is really low. And for example, if you have experience with Americans or British, you will know that people don't respect their team leader because they're their team leader. I respect you because I think you're worthwhile, but just because you're my leader doesn't make any difference to me. So if I don't trust what you're saying, I don't believe what you're saying, I'm going to do my own thing. Okay? But it's focused on achievement. And we ask people to share a metaphor. So being a team leader is like what? And in this case, they use a mechanical metaphor. Team leaders, team leadership is like having an engine in a car. And if a part isn't working, you take the part off, throw it away, put something else on. I started this research originally because I was teaching in our executive education uh, area, and I was really struggling. Every time I would have a group of um, executives from the GCC, they would look at me when I'm talking about this kind of idea for, of performance management. How do you get people out of your organization? You know, basically, how do you fire people uh, and move people on? Um, and they would look at me like, I don't understand anything you're telling me. Okay? And it really, really struck me. What is it that I don't understand about leadership in this region of the world that that makes no, not a lot of sense? So, I went on and did, these, did this research. Here's what people from uh, China say, and then I'll talk about people from this region. So, I was also interested in China because in many, if you read most textbooks about culture, they will tell you that the Middle East and China are very similar. And of course, they're nothing, nothing of the type. <laughs> There's some very significant differences. So, um, they're highly collectivistic and high power distance, that's the similarity. Um, they focus on guanxi, which is relationships, meaning I cannot work with you if I do not like you. So liking matters within the workplace. Diversity is unrelated to performance in teams. That alone tends to surprise some people. People have very strong views about this, uh, based in their own views of the world, usually. Uh, diversity is an important thing, a really good thing for a team and so on. Or, you know, actually I know that diversity gets in the way. It makes it hard to work together. Okay? So the political conservatives of the world tend to be skeptical and say what they see is disruption. Um, the pro political liberals of the world tend to see uh, diversity as the answer to all things. What the data actually show is that that it's unrelated, after about 10,000 maybe studies or so. But what the data actually show is this. So if you do a linear regression, it's flat, but the data actually are in a kind of trumpet you know, shape here where the funnel goes out. So that the best teams in the distribution are high, highly diverse. The worst teams in the distribution are also highly diverse. So what does that mean? How do we distinguish between them? What that means is diversity is required for world-class performance, but it's risky. The more, you, the more diverse the team is, the more potential risk there is to go that way rather than that way. 
within the team. Um, and this is actually, you know, the difference is in strong leadership within a team. So if you want to make sure you're on that trajectory, you know, you better invest in leadership. If you otherwise, you could end up on that trajectory going down. Okay. Point here is this too. How does that happen? Through conflict. Managing conflict is a central part of any team leader's role or any team needs to focus on conflict. I spent most of my last 20 years studying this in teams. Here's a kind of formal definition. A serious incompatibility between two or more opinions, principles, interests. So here are a couple of uh, slides or sayings about team and conflict I like. So we fight not because we truly disagree, but rather because we tend to, um, we fail to understand one another. That happens more often than we'd like to think. Um, it's not really that we fundamentally disagree, we're just seeing some different aspect of the same thing. 10% of conflict is due to difference of opinion, 90% due to the wrong tone of voice. There's a lot of truth in that. And remember that nothing worthwhile gets done without conflict. Conflict in a team is the very essence of what makes teams work. I understand this, you understand that. If we can actually work together, okay, and actually effectively coordinate, I want to work with you, but you see the world in such a different way from me. If we can work together, great. If we can't work together, we're not going to make it happen. So I'm just going to explore a little bit here with you some of the conflict things. So here is some work I've been doing in the last couple of, well, about last year or so. How do team conflicts begin? Is it a rotten apple? One nasty person creates most conflict in a team. Is it a conflict between two individuals and the rest of us have, are arguing along with it? Or is it just a fundamental divide within a team? Now, here's what we find. Most conflict in teams is not really team conflict. It's one difficult individual, or it's two individuals, and everybody else has to take sides within that team. Far less likely to be a kind of truly team conflict here. So this is a diagram just talking about how conflict changes over time. What it shows is that there are different, two different types of conflict I'm talking about here. Task conflict and relationship conflict. Task conflict, the one on the bottom, is debate discussion, which tends to be two people disagree, two people still disagree, two people still disagree. It's kind of boring. Relationship conflict, which is negative affect, I hate you, is, starts off kind of, most people don't report it, over time, it looks like a dyad because somebody's challenged you, and over time, most negative affect in teams is driven by one profoundly difficult individual. Okay? And these are you know, real work teams, uh, people coming to our executive programs over the last couple of years um, from all over the world. So three different types of conflict. I'll talk about each one. First, task conflict, debate, discussion. Disagreement about the content of decisions, difference in viewpoints and opinion. So, and, you know, the plus side to it is it encourages divergent thinking. Downside, it actually can distract you. Too much can create a problem. So if I look at the relationship between performance and conflict within a team, what does it suggest? Any thoughts? Maybe down? Task conflict or debate. Here's what it shows. So a degree of task conflict or discussion uh, is necessary for you to make a good decision. If you're not having any conflict, probably you're not really talking about what matters. Some degree of discussion, good. Too much discussion, bad. Okay? It actually starts to undermine you if you can't agree on anything. Well, great question. How do I determine the optimum point here? It depends somewhat on the specific task we're doing here. So um, it should be enough conflict that we have a, a real debate about the issues, not so much that we're debating the premise of the conversation. 
So, you know, if we're debating uh, the meaning of the memo from the boss, okay, this isn't helpful. This is too much. If we are debating, you know, um, we understand what the boss is saying, and it, we could do this, we could do that, that's usually helpful. Um, if we just say no discussion, no debate, that's not helpful. So it, yeah, that's why you end up with this kind of inverted U, if that helps. Um, next, we have relationship conflict, negative affect, I hate you. You know, it tends to be associated with poor decision making. You try to want to, want to mostly want to try to avoid it if possible. It distracts you from the main event of the team. So the relationship between relationship conflict and performance should be what? Yeah, straight down. So it should look like that. And it's largely what we find. However, in every real world group we've ever looked at, on average, they are strongly positively correlated. So this is actually the study I, this is a study I published back in 2000, actually. It's the study that I'm most well known for in, you know, in psychology, showing that we used to think of them as two separate things, but they are actually fairly strongly uh, related to each other. So we encourage a debate. If you're not careful, you encourage people to dislike each other. Once you have disliking within the room, it's very difficult to recover. So the best way to deal with this is to have a good, strong, trusting relationship between people. If you have trust, you can do one, get, have debate without getting personal. Here's the problem with trust. How do I make you trust me? What can I do? Time. Sorry? Time. Time. Time helps. Being honest. Being honest, yeah. Yeah, so now we're getting to the common connection experience. We experience something together, we come out, we learn from each other, and we come out the other side with a higher degree of trust. The problem, that's why, that's why teams take time. Because you cannot make this happen quickly. There are a lot of consultants out there that will, you know, have you go off to some adventure park, fall backwards and have people catch you, you know, climb up a pole together, um, et cetera, et cetera, the data on that are pretty bad. <laughs> you know, you can't make this stuff up. You have to work together. You have to experience something together in order for real trust to emerge. So quite frankly, though, in a lot of, and be careful, by the way, I've also done this study repeatedly. You ask the team how much they trust each other. Everybody in the team says how much trust they think is within the team. The only person who's absolutely wrong is the team leader. And this happens over and over and over. And I looked at it from Fortune 500 you know, top management teams right down to teams in a laboratory. And this always happens. It's unrelated, utterly unrelated to the real level of trust within the team. And here's why I think it's going on. So we're a team of five people here. And I'm the leader. And in round one, okay, you were most persuasive. Okay? You, I took your advice. We went with it. Now, next time around, you want to be more influential. You think your idea is better. So what you're going to do is you're going to be as influential as you can in the meeting. And then you're going to get out the dagger and smile at me as you're stabbing your teammate in the back, right? Because if you can take her out, that leaves you, okay? And everybody else on the team sees it, but the team leader doesn't. Because, every, you know, who's going to show that to your leader? Nobody. So you smile, you nod, <coughs> stabbing your neighbor in the back. And it's quite successful. That's politics in the real world. Um, so the only way to really know, you know, as a team leader, whether people genuinely trust each other is you've got you know, you to find some kind of anonymous process or feedback because it's, don't just assume you know when trust exists within your team. You're going you're gonna to find some nasty surprises. 
Um, other people within the team know. Team leaders almost never know. And what that means is you've got to focus on process within your team. So process discussion is how much time I spend on things, who does what, what contributions we make, and so on. Um, what I can tell you is this is the stuff that people get most emotional about in teams. If you want to know what makes people angry, this, more than anything else. Now, you've got to try to make a decision. And um, the best decision process is when trust is high. So it probably not, probably something you already knew before you walked in. Um, trust can be very tricky to measure, but if you've got it, it's gold dust, go with it. However, that's not that often. So here is, for example, how you should think about trust. Uh, sorry, when trust doesn't exist, how you should think about decision making. You could start with something called qualified consensus, which is Everybody thinks this is not a bad idea, OK? Um, that would be um, you know, a, a fairly useful way if you can manage it. Second, leader decide. Or last, majority rule. Anything that looks or smells like voting is a bad idea. Do not do it, OK? Now, the reason for this is no matter where you are, you know, majority rule, majority, you know, control over minority in a team means the minority people who lose disengage from the team. It's the same in politics as it is actually in, in a small team. Um, people, um, the, even the losers need to be engaged with your team and voting tends to turn people off. So you want to focus on consensus, do something maybe perhaps leader decide but try to avoid any kind of voting to resolve process conflict. So here's from uh, another study that just that last year won the best uh, paper in conflict management for the past decade uh, with one of my former students and me. What we found in teams is this. The best teams are those that think about conflict preemptively or proactively. So they anticipate we could have these conflicts. And they focus on strategies that work for everybody rather than strategies that work just for one individual. So for example, if I go back well, many years ago, 20 years ago, one of my best friends from elementary school right on uh, was a consultant for one of the big consultancies. He showed me when he used to work with, with his people a long letter of all the conflicts he thought might be able to might merge and how it would be resolved if it happened. And I thought, wow, this seems like overkill. I'm not really sure about this. Roll on 20 years later, I'm doing this research, and I realize he was exactly right. Because he was preempting the issues of a conflict. Now, you can make other compromises. If you want a team that has good performance, but not necessarily happy, you can wait for conflict to emerge. These teams, people are unhappy because conflict has emerged, and uh, the whole team strategies uh, that will resolve it. Or you can make people happy by talking about individual uh, strategies um, and talk about them early. Or you can wait for conflict to emerge and then try to resolve the conflict with each individual. That will result in a bad team in terms of performance and people who are unhappy together. So the lesson is, think about the conflicts that might emerge in your team, plan for them, and plan things that everybody in the team can support. That's the basic takeaway from that. Um, so remember, we're back to this point about diversity and managing conflict. Diversity is required for high performance teams, but those teams have the potential to spiral out of the, you know, to be the best, but also to spiral downwards. Um, so a just short list of things that research suggests will get you higher performance in your teams. One, take time. Start further back. When you use a team, you have to spend the time. Okay? Um, goals need to be discussed. You, know, you need to agree decision-making process, identify team values. Two, emphasize the need for coordination. Okay? 
the idea that we need to actually work together, understand each other, that um, I'm going to go quickly through this and focus here. All team members need to have common understanding. The uh, hope not misunderstanding. Um, three, uh, that's where pointing out diversity helps. Three, actively manage conflict. A lot of teams like to avoid conflict. A lot of team leaders like to avoid it. And I'm going to encourage you to get out there and try to actively manage conflict within your team, especially if you feel relationship conflict coming on, to back away from that. Um, trust is key. When you trust, go straight ahead. When you don't, don't resort to voting. If you're doing anything virtually, you need to meet together first. Build relationships first before. So if you're building together a group of people, if you're working in one of these settings where part of the team is in a different part of the world, it does actually pay to bring people together. It's actually worth the money. And when you bring them together, don't talk about business. Have them socialize with each other. Okay? Research is very clear on this. Get them to socialize, get to know each other. You get a much better outcome here. And five, team leaders need to be self-aware and open to feedback. The, remember I talked about how teams, you need to allow your team to explore here. When you do that, they're going to surprise you. And you need to be prepared for that, be open to the idea that maybe they have even, a, they've come up with an even better idea than you have. Okay. So that was the Stingray model kind of idea. Now, if you have any kind of, if you have any interest in any of these type of topics, I have a personal website. Uh, randallispeterson.com, which has everything I have ever written, every video I have ever made, and it's all free. If there's, you want to know more about it, just go on that site, download anything you like. Okay? My mission uh, as an academic is to do my bit to help people make the world a better place, which is why I just want everybody to learn from it uh, and, uh, and get the, some more out there. I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn if you want if you want to see what I'm talking about as well. Um, I do want to make sure we have at least a few minutes or a little bit of time for questions as well about any of these issues. All right. Can you go back to the five? Which one? That one. Right. So those are some of the key takeaways uh, from Teams. Yeah, so a team exercise that emerges a little bit of conflict and you work together to resolve it. That's the best outcome you can have. So there are lots of activities you can create uh, or find out there where there's disagreement. So, you know, I use something called project planning, uh, which is put the steps to managing a project uh, in the correct order. And it creates some degree of conflict and discussion. And then when they resolve that, hopefully if they've done well, they actually end up, you know, better off, even if they didn't do that well on the task. Question. Ah, great question, which is about, uh, which is the stuff related to process conflict, which is the stuff that gets most people most emotional, right? So the best way to deal with that is to talk about it early and to do something that everybody can live with. Um, and it's not easy because, um, you know, nobody's going to say, oh, by the way, I'm not going to do what I've been told to do. So we just, you have to talk about it in principle before people get angry. Because once they're angry, they're not very rational anymore. So, um, you know, raise the issue, try to deal with it preemptively, and try to... So, if it's already happened, right, the best thing you can do to maintain performance is to say, we should talk about you know, this, and focus people on what will fix it. Don't go to blame. Teams tend to go to blame very quickly, which is, you know, here's all, you know, your fault. Try to avoid that at all costs. Because the fact that I misunderstood you 
Is it your fault for not being clear? Is it my fault for not understanding? In reality, it's probably both. So don't blame, fix. Okay, if it's already happened. Try to get qualified consensus where everybody says, okay, I can live with it. Okay, now real consensus is ideal. That would be even better, but you know, most of the time it's like, okay, it's not so bad. Um, you know, but try to avoid anything which kind of enforces it, this group enforces it on that person. That's the stuff that will turn everybody off. Yeah. I would say both. Try to preempt it, and as soon as you start to see it, try to think about what you can do with it. A degree of task conflict, not so bad. A degree of I hate you, right? Not, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, is the poison pill of every group. So you'll definitely want to try to, now that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be best buddies or best mates. What it means is, you know, what do we each bring to the table? You know, can we appreciate that and can we work together? Okay, sometimes that's the best outcome you can get. And I also have another question about it. So when, when there's a leader or a group, sometimes he will absorb the conflict or the mistake or the failure or the loss, just so the team can come back and be empowered and continue on. Is this a negative thing to do? Because it will pile up on the leader and then he looks negative towards the group. That he is continuously doing the mistake when in reality the team are doing the mistake, but he's yeah, I think for the most part, um, I think it's very similar to the answer I gave here, which is try not to go down the blame game because most teams love to hold individuals accountable. They love that. It's such a bad instinct. Okay, for the most part, it actually just backfires on you. Here's why. If we decide that you are the reason that we failed, okay, if we decide that, Everybody else says, yeah, 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 great, her fault. After you think about it a little while, you realize we ganged up on her. And actually, they can gang up on me the next time. It makes it unsafe. It makes it feel like I could be attacked at any moment just the way we went after her. And then people don't feel comfortable. So just try to say, look, I know you want to blame, OK? Stop right there, OK? Let's reel back. Let's just focus on how to fix this you'll get a much better outcome in, in the team. I mean, in families too. Um, you know, for me, uh, my father died just over a year ago and it created incredible conflict within the family. Um, I, it was total a surprise to me. And I've never done such a tough mediation as between my mother and my sister. Um, and it really was like, don't blame each other about things that happen. Let's just focus on, you know, how we're going to live together going forward. We got there, <laughs> okay? Um, it doesn't make it easy, but that is the, what you need to do in a team. Try not to go to blame. Try to focus on how we fix going forward. Okay, I've said it like four times because it's like the, one of the main messages I want to make sure you get across here. Uh, because teams love to blame. What about yeah. cultures that are not there are lots of places in the world that are not very confrontational. I, I grew up in one where conflict is never allowed. Um, if you've ever been to the American Midwest, I grew up in Minneapolis. Um, and, and they call it Minnesota nice. Okay? Minnesota nice means we never express disagreement, ever. Okay? But if you think people aren't really disagreeing, you know, of course they are. Um, and so it's never kind of overtly rude. And yet, I mean, we can all, if you have any experience in that culture, you know it you see, when you see it. And the most of the same, the same rules pretty much apply. So, in fact, let's not confront each other over it. They're happy with that, but let's fix it. That's going to be the hard part. How do I get them to say, okay, we can acknowledge that maybe there's something here. Okay, but look, what are we doing going forward? How are we going to work on this? How are we going to anticipate this and make sure it doesn't happen in the future? Um, you know, the basic principle still works. And indeed, that's one of the reasons I started studying conflict um, way back in graduate school is because I'm, you know, I came from a culture where you just don't, con they don't confront ever. 
Um, my biggest culture shock in my entire life was moving from Minneapolis to California. Way bigger than moving to London or going anywhere else I've ever been in the world. Um, and mainly over this, where you couldn't confront it in California. Everything is just out there. I don't like the way you look. Um, okay, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I, I learned to appreciate it over time, but it's still, every time I go back, it still feels as foreign as any foreign country to me. Um, but I think that's why. It was a bit longer explanation, but I think that's why conflict for me is so important and why even if you're in a culture that tends to downplay conflict, that you, um, you do actually have to actively manage it, um, again, but by being preemptive, by, um, by trying, not to, trying to avoid blame of individuals within the team. Yeah, question? From my experience, one of the difficult people in the team, the one Oh yeah, we all know that one. Yeah, it's actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've I've had this too. I you know, I spent years as deputy dean of the school and leading my group of faculty, and faculty love this style, right? They all have tenure and a point of view. Oi. Uh, and, you know, the best thing you can do there is, you know, they're going to do it a few times anyway. And then when people start giving all the nonverbals that are the kind of like, like, okay, enough, enough, hello, stop. Um, then your responsibility as team leader is to say, I know you like to throw that bomb in there, but we're not actually going to go there now. And shut it down. It's kind of harsh. You know, it, because what I've also, one of the things that I, a study I did in my dissertation way back in graduate school was looking at whether leaders were kind of process directive or outcome directive. And we had uh, this condition where, um, you know, a certain member of the team just starts doing that, where they just start talking. What's interesting is that the rest of the team did not blame that individual. When things went wrong, they held the leader accountable for not stopping it. So that's the risk. If you don't stop it, they turn on you and say, okay, the leader is useless or not helpful because he won't stop this person from engaging in this behavior, which everybody knows is disruptive. Um, so that's you know, a bit harsh, but I think that's the best advice for how to handle that. 